In a lot of ways, I certainly hope that the American nation is just like the American Republic. After all, the intention was to bring forward the story presented by public documents uh, about development of ordered liberty and constitutional government in America. That said, it had to be, in many ways, a different volume. While it's still using primary sources, there were many more primary sources available, many different issues brought out during this period of history between the Civil War, the beginnings of the Civil War, and the opening of World War II. America went through a lot. Not just the Civil War, but Reconstruction. And on top of that, the development of institutions of national markets, the breakdown of states' rights after the Civil War, the development of bodies of thought regarding the role of religion in public life, regarding the importance of pragmatism, regarding various forms of reform, the development of an industrial class and attempts at social reforms aimed at relieving poverty. America's explosion onto the world stage as an international power, our involvement in world wars and what that meant for liberties at home and our engagement abroad. And toward the end of this, the crisis of the Great Depression and the ways in which that crisis was addressed by uh, the Roosevelt administration and the way the Roosevelt administration's programs were in many ways countered by a Supreme Court concerned to maintain the structure of our inherited constitutional government. The emphasis is the same. The materials are the same in the sense that they're primary sources. And my goal remains the same, for people to be able to learn for themselves what was important in terms of public documents, but also in terms of people's debates over primary issues relating to what kind of public life Americans had and wanted. It's not a book that one is going to sit down and read from cover to cover in a night or two, but it is the kind of book that can be dipped into time and time again, I would hope, and from which somebody in middle school can get a lot, but which somebody in high school can get a lot more, and someone in college and even graduate school will find highly useful to read through at a class, say, in American political thought. So I think it uh, has, in one sense, an audience of everybody, but different audiences will find different things in it. Document selection was actually more difficult for the American nation than it was for the American Republic. In part, this is because there were so many more to choose from. There have just been a lot more laws passed. There have been a lot more public arguments about very, very foundational issues. Not one or two foundational issues, as there were at the time of the American founding, but very different foundational issues. Uh, we had an active debate over immigration going back a very long time ago. There was a socialist party in the United States that, which ran on a national ticket during the early 20th century. I wanted very much for this volume to be accessible to young people as well as fruitful for college and even graduate students. And that meant that we had to take the uh, more theoretical provisions in public laws as well as giving them uh, more detailed sections where that was important. The time frame of this volume uh, goes from the Civil War through the lead up to World War II. This was in part intended to follow the more traditional curriculum of history classes that had been standard in colleges up until a couple of decades ago. The other reason for keeping the time frame limited was simply because so much went on during this era. We have progressivism, we have reconstruction, we have the Great Depression, we have great social movements swinging across America. So I think it's a very important and a very interesting time period 
that sometimes doesn't get as much in-depth treatment as it deserves. Because again, as happens in a number of historical epochs, those who lost the debate tend to have been lost themselves. Frederick Winslow Taylor did a book on the principles of scientific management. We included a short excerpt from this which uh, presents the format and basic concerns that he has for the book. And it sounds like an odd little piece to include, and it is a rather odd little piece in many ways, but it's one of those documents that I really wanted to include, even as I had done in some instances in the first volume, because it sums up the way of thinking and the central concerns of a great number of people who were important to the development of our public life. So it's really my favorite, not so much because I enjoy it, reading it the most. It's not the, uh, the best use of language we've got there. We've got selections from uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Andrew Carnegie that are much more fun from that level. But I really like it because I think it shines a light on much of what's going on throughout this era. The first was to present to readers and students development along a timeline. That is obviously time was passing and certain big events took place and we want to bring people in a coherent fashion up toward the present. So when we have important events, in this case most importantly the Civil War and its aftermath, Reconstruction, those are such important events in time that they simply come first and we deal with the important uh, documents and sub-events, if you will, within each of those. So it really had to be a balance between important issues that transcend specific time periods and time periods that are dominated by a particular issue that need to be dealt with coherently. I would like to mention uh, two people in particular who helped out a great deal in serving on the editorial boards for, for both volumes. The first is my, my great friend uh, and colleague, the, the late George Carey, who was a real inspiration behind uh, much of this work. In addition, I want to point out the key role played by uh, a man named Danton Costanderitis who chose several of the documents for me, including one uh, in the first volume, I have uh, a selection from Davy Crockett, which I would not have thought of putting in had it not been for Danton. So I really uh, owe him a great debt for that. And there are a number of other documents that I wouldn't want to bore you with mentioning that owe their uh, inclusion to suggestions I had, in particular from these two, but also from uh, another colleague of mine, Robert Waters, who helped uh, from a teacher's point of view, 